Okay, I think we'll get started. Um, thank you all for attending tonight. Before I start, I'd like to um, perform an acknowledgement of country. I'd like to acknowledge the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation, um, who are the traditional owners um, of the land in which we gather today. I'd like to pay my respects to the elders past and present and extend my respects to the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Island people that may be here today from other communities. Welcome everyone to the Horn and Wilcox Q&A 2019 event. I think this is our fifth or sixth year of running this event and every year it seems to get more and more positive feedback. Tonight really is all about you. It's not about us, it's really about you getting some more information about us as a firm um, and hopefully you're in a, a fortunate position in a few weeks time where you have an offer from us and maybe some other firms that might just give you some inf more information as opposed to the, the websites or the glossy brochures that you read as well. So you're going to hear from real people tonight, um, I promise, and it's not just going to be the, the older statesmen of the audience as well. My name is Gavin McRae. For those who I haven't met, um, I've done a few interviews in the past couple of weeks, but um, it's a pleasure meeting all those people that I have met before and for the new faces, um, welcome here tonight. I'm a partner at Hall & Wilcox in the statutory insurance team. I'm also the partner responsible for the graduate program and the seasonal clerkship um, Melbourne program. We're delighted to see you all here tonight. Um, we may be slightly biased here tonight, you probably gather that, but we genuinely think Hall & Wilcox is a great place to start your legal career. Um, we're a very progressive and growing firm. We're national with offices in Melbourne, Sydney, Newcastle, Perth, Canberra, Brisbane, and now Darwin. Every year I do this, it seems to be another um, office that's added to the program. We have approximately 700 people working at our firm nationally, including 85 partners. Undertaking a seasonal clerkship with us in our Melbourne office will be the first step towards becoming a graduate and hopefully fulfilling a long um, and great career here at Hall & Wilcox. Our clerkship program is really a snapshot of what the graduate year would be like. Undertaking a graduate year would see you rotate through four different sections, learn from a great number of professionals and get development and success in whatever you do. Not only as a grad lawyer, but well beyond. We really invest in our young people here in Hall and Wilcox, and you'll be able to see that here tonight if you haven't already. Tonight, we have a great panel of lawyers ready to answer any questions that you might have. We will do our best to answer any questions at all. And if we don't, we will do our best to get back to you and answer individually to you after the, the, the night. Um, I'd like to start off, actually, before I start off, introduce you to the panel. We're going to run probably for about 50 minutes till about 6.30. Um, if you can stay after that, that'd be fantastic. If you can't, we, we understand that everyone's got other things on and are very busy, but if you'd like to stay after, we're gonna have some drinks for another hour or so and we'll conclude at about 7.30. So after the panel gives um, their presentation and we hear from the audience, feel free to stay for an hour or so, have drinks, some food, chat to anyone from the panel. There'll be other lawyers coming up throughout the night. Um, it's a great chance to really get some final questions out the way. There'll be a prize also for the first person that asks a question tonight. So just remember that. So we just wanna get things rolling pretty quickly here. I'll ask a few questions to our panel and then I'll open up to the audience. So remember, be the first one with your hand in the air and Lauren will have a prize for you. So first of all, we've got Anne Wong on our panel. She's currently a graduate lawyer rotating through our tax team. We've got Todd Bromwich. He's a lawyer in our tax team. Todd did his graduate year in 2016. Steph Rocker in the middle. She's a lawyer in our graduate insurance team, sorry, our statutory insurance team. She did her graduate year in 2015. We've got Hall of Famer, Catherine Sharp here. She completed her graduate year in 2012 and she's a senior associate in our statutory, sorry, in our commercial dispute resolution team. And I think this is maybe your fifth Q and A event, Catherine. So thank you for uh, giving us some of your time. Um, and last but not least, we've got Charlie Rennie on the end. Charlie's current grad and Charlie is rotating through the banking and financial services team currently. So I'm gonna start off with a question. And this question is actually gonna be for Steph because she wanted me to ask this to her. Um, <laughs> what advice would you give to our um, audience um, in terms of their seasonal clerkship or graduate year at Holland Wilcox in order to have the best possible experience? Give us some tips. 
I promise this is the truth and I haven't just said this because I've had time to plan it. <laughs> but um, I've reflected on this and I have two pieces of advice about how you should approach this process. And the first is to have a really open mind. So you might think that you know what you want to do, you know what team you'd like to end up in, and you might be disappointed if you're not put there for your clerkship or if you're not able to rotate through that team in your graduate year. My experience was that you honestly have no idea what and what it would be like to work in a team until you've had an opportunity to experience it. So don't write anything off until you tried it and just keep a really open mind. My second piece of advice would be to get yourself as involved as possible. Really immerse yourself in all of the opportunities that will come your way. And there will be so many. There will be social events. There will be sporting events. There will be um, smarter law initiatives that are happening all the time. The more of them you get involved in, the more people you meet, and it just creates a really wonderful experience at, at the end of it. Thanks, Tiff. Um, Todd, do you want to? Oh, that's um, very upsetting to hear that because I jotted down some notes against some of these Dorothy Dixes earlier, and the two things I wrote were open mind and get involved. <laughs> <laughs> So I feel like Steph's been copied Beautiful. Uh, Does anyone else have yes. anything to add? <laughs> We're running very smoothly here. Clearly. <laughs> okay, I will go to the next question. Thank you, Steph, for that thoroughness. Um, and I might start off with you here. Um, what did you find to be your biggest challenge so far in your graduate year or your clerkship? Um, and um, what skills do you think are important? Thanks, Gavin. Um, I think my biggest challenge mm -hmm. was um, having that information overload because you do learn lots and lots of new things, whether it's about the law or whether it's learning how different people work um, on different matters, and that can sometimes be quite mentally exhausting, but it's definitely a steep but good learning curve, and as a junior, you really need to be a sponge. You gotta just absorb, 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 and you've gotta be keen to learn. Um, in terms of key skills, I find that having attention to detail is really important. Um, and being enthusiastic about the work, because I mean, the last thing a senior associate or lawyer will want to experience is when they give you a piece of work and you know, you're not keen and you're not enthusiastic about it and that can be quite um, disheartening. But also, you know, working in a law firm, having good attention to detail is important because you're not expected to know the, the technical side of things. What you are expected to know and to have is that good attention to detail. Right. What about Charlie? Because you're completing your graduate year now. Um, do you have anything to add? Um, hello, everyone. Um, in terms of, can everyone hear me through the mic? My, I think the most challenging thing for me coming in was being able to manage expectations. I think when you're at uni, it's a matter of, oh, I let the lecturer down, they don't even know my name. But of course, when you come into a corporate environment like this, you're working directly with um, senior associates, with partners like Gav, with other lawyers who are in effect at a junior level, your clients and you're accountable to them um, and being able to communicate with them what your capacity is um, and being able to well, effectively manage your workload. I think that's um, something that the transition between uni and work life is a big jump. Um, but in terms of a way of dealing with that, and I think a key skill that's important is sometimes being able to take a step back. Um, take a step back, you might be you know, a long way down the rabbit hole in a research task and have no idea what you're doing. But sometimes it's that ability to take a step back and say, oh, well, how important is this key issue or are we hitting this element properly? Um, that's something I'd really recommend. Um, even if you're taking on a task, like if you come here as a clerk, we'll get you involved in the daily quiz, um, which is sort of, you get up and say in front of everyone, let's take a step back. It's, you're not just reading the quiz, but it's also, you look back at it and say, well, that's an opportunity to you know, develop my personal speaking, public, public speaking skills, as I started on that point. Um, <laughs> so being able to, I don't know, yes, get involved at a minute detailed level, but also take a step back and realize why you're doing things um, and how important they are. Terrific. Um, I'll go on to another question now. This is probably for our lawyers at the table. Um, I'll start off with you, Catherine. Uh, what factors um, informed your decision to work in the CDR team um, in, as opposed to other sections that you rotated through, if you can remember back in 2012? <laughs> it's a long time ago, but I can remember. Um, 
Actually, just picking up on something that Steph started off with, I walked into Holland Wilcox with the very clear idea that I was going to be an IP lawyer. Um, I was quite determined. I was working, going to work with Ben Hamilton. That was what I was going to do. Um, Miranda loves, who's one of our HR team members, loves to tell me that she always knew I'd be a litigator. Um, and that's why she placed me my last rotation in litigation in my grad year. And for my clerkship, I was also in litigation. So for me, as I worked through my grad year, a lot of different sections appealed to me for different reasons. Um, but one clear distinction I was able to make was that I did like litigation and not um, transactional work. And I think that's a distinction that a lot of people can make and can make fairly quickly. Um, so that immediately narrowed my field down. Um, and then for me, it just came down to what I loved and what I enjoyed doing, what I found challenging. Um, and I beauty about Holland Wilcox and the beauty about getting around to so many sections through your grad year is you get to know a lot of people and you can bounce your ideas off them. I had a lot of discussions saying, oh, I like this, I don't like that. And you can speak to people who have been there five years ahead of you, 10 years ahead of you, um, and they can give you really good advice. So it's a very personal decision, um, but there will be clues along the way. Perfect. Uh, Todd, so Steph doesn't steal your question. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, so at the end of my um, grad program, I was, so I went through tax and private clients, corporate and commercial banking, financial services, and then CDR, accounts team. Um, and at the end of my grad year, I was kind of tossing up between the litigation team and tax. Um, and there were a lot of things that appealed to me about both of them. Um, you could kind of get, in both of them, you could kind of get involved in the, the, the depth of the technical detail of, um, of certain issues. Uh, the, the whole commercial negotiation side of things appeals to some people, but it just wasn't, you know, that wasn't for me. Um, and so both of these teams had that same element and I liked the dispute work, which both the teams do. And so it was kind of a bit of an even draw for me uh, until I kind of sat down and I just kind of re realised that tax was the one um, that was where I could see myself uh, having a long-term career and challenging myself. Um, and to be honest, I just hated the court rules. Uh, it wasn't for me. Um, <laughs> Yeah, the, the, I think the, the technical depth that you can get into in um, certain areas is what appeals to me, but I think other people, other people will have, you know, the, the negotiation or like the cut and thrust of uh, corporate and commercial and maybe the banking team. And I think you just got to find what style of work appeals to you um, and just keep an open mind along the way because, you know, tax, I never thought I'd end up in it. And you know, until you actually work in the team, you have no idea. Steph, not a tax lawyer, Steph? I'm not a tax lawyer, but funnily enough, when I was at uni, I was like half convinced that I was going to be a tax lawyer. I had studied tax, I'd loved it, I'd done my thesis on it, and I thought, well, this is it, this is what I'm going to do. And then I spent some time in our statutory insurance team, and I, it sounds cliche, but it's kind of like a fire fire and pity your belly feeling, like, yeah, I love this, I want to do this. I would see people coming back from court and everyone talking to them about what had been happening down at court that day. So-and-so was cross-examined and this was the evidence and I just thought, I want to do that, I want to be in court, I want to be making submissions to the other side about our cases. And I also really loved the element of the people stories that I was exposed to in our, in our team. Um, and for me, that was what really sold me that even though I was so certain that I was going to be a tax lawyer, I actually wanted to um, end up in SIB and start my career in that area. Terrific. And just as a side note, um, Steph did run her first damages trial last week and she had a massive win. So congratulations, Steph. And that's one of the reasons why you became a statutory insurance lawyer. <laughs> Um, just before I open up to the audience, maybe if we could just hear quickly from Anne and Charlie about a memory from their clerkship since it was only last year and maybe what made you decide Hall and Wilcox? Anne? Um, I had a great experience um, in my season clerkship. So I, I did it in corporate and commercial and there was one day where I was flicking through the newspaper and saw an article on blockchain and the adoption of blockchain technology. Um, in the ASX and I thought oh this is great we should write something about this so I approached my supervising partner um, James Mobile and I said hey this is something really interesting um, do you reckon it would be worth um, Paul Cox publishing something about it 
And to my surprise, he, he was like, not only, yes, that's a great idea, why don't you write it? Um, and I was like, that's an amazing opportunity. And that's essentially what you get here. You know, Holocox really invests in your juniors and they're open to your ideas. And they also do recognize you um, for the work that you do. Because as a seasoned clerk, after writing that article, um, I finished my clerkship and then received a private message on LinkedIn from the supervising partner saying, hey, this is published. Um, we've also got your name in the article. And so I'm like, this is really great from a partner level. And that's consistent across the firm. So that's something I really value. Terrific. Charlie? Um, I'd probably echo Anne on that point. So I clerked in the summer of 2017 with Anne. Um, I clerked in the tax team with Todd. I think Todd might have been my um, buddy, actually. Um, I can remember writing a piece of advice or doing a research task on a piece of advice. And after I did that, I came back and uh, if anyone's looked at tax, it's not the uh, most bread and butter topic. Um, thinking, oh, that was pretty tricky. I think I've got it going back to them. And the partner I was working with sat down. We had a really in-depth chat about it. And a lot of the research I did actually ended up in the memo, um, especially as something has just literally been sort of the wording, been copied and pasted almost. Um, and when you see that, then go out to a client. It really gave you that sense of pride in your work and that you're not just a junior, you are a part of the team and what you deliver is valued and they wouldn't ask you to do something if they weren't going to use it and rely on it. Um, and I think that's something as a junior um, I really looked for. Um, I also got the sense that Hall & Wilcox was a firm that was here but also wants to be there in the future. I think they've got a very good sense of where they want to be with their focus on smarter law and the introduction of, or incorporation of technology and I think that was something that um, really attracted me to the firm. Um, I think a firm on the rise was the, um, the uh, slogan at the time and I think that's definitely something that isn't just a slogan, but actually plays out. Um, I think that's something that really ticked all the boxes for me. Terrific. We've got a, um, a microphone Lauren has at the front. So if anyone would like to ask a question, oh, he's got his hand up straight away. There we go. Prize. Ask our pet question to our uh, panel. Uh, thanks, everybody. Um, so I guess, and Charlie sort of touched on it, one of the hallmarks you hold out in Hall of Cops is evolve. So I was just wondering if you could share from your experiences how. Holland Wilcox will help you evolve as a person or evolve. Sure. Who would like to start that off? Um, well, not only as a junior, but even as a partner, you see it, they run sessions. We have our learning development team. If some of these guys are here and you'll be able to talk to later tonight. Um, it's constant. Every week there's some sort of seminar you can go to. Um, last, on Monday, I was at a seminar on insolvency, so 101 for insolvency practitioners, which I it's an area I'm interested in, but I might not practice in it. There are a lot of partners there from other teams, for instance, in banking, who were also there because they were curious. Um, I'd say it's never ending. Um, I've got some friends at the firm who are paralegals who are going on to do courses to help them with their, um, not necessarily law degrees, but to help them with their uh, management and their practice. So from you know, bottom to top, it's nonstop. And I think the firm really encourages you to take that extra step, um, be that through seminars. There's also, you'll see this when you're a clerk, um, a structured um, sort of supervisor role. There's a, you'll have a buddy, a mentor and a supervisor and they're the people who sort of really look after you and make sure you're you know, hitting those steps, getting the feedback that you need. So from day one, um, there's always someone looking out for you and helping you to become the better lawyer tomorrow. I just echo what Charlie said there. Um, and just, it doesn't stop after your grad year either. It doesn't stop after your first year. There is a structured program in place to follow you through your career. Um, and there's also the informal program as well. I mean, a lot of our mentoring and support is not from your formal mentor or your supervising partner. It's from the senior associate you know in CIV or the lawyer you know in tax who you see in the kitchen once a week and are happy to have a chat to as well that are really good informal mentoring processes. Um, as a more senior lawyer now, I've also had the benefit of a lot of formal courses, not only towards my legal and technical skills, but also towards how I operate as a lawyer, a team member, um, and as a leader. So recently I completed the Women in Leadership course, which is the course they run nationally. Um, women from around our offices in Australia come to Melbourne. We have five sessions, I think, in total across six months. Um, and it's a great way to build your network, build your friendships, but also um, develop skills that are not just technical. And? I think I'll just add to that evolve always because it is a huge um, hallmark amongst our other hallmarks as well. And it, it does align with our smart law practice. So in terms of evolving always, we always try to, to become a better lawyer. And 
sometimes, or at least a lot of times, by being a better lawyer means, you know, being able to work more efficiently, being able to service our clients and deliver creative, innovative solutions for them. And the good thing about Hong Wilcox is that from the top down, they are very open to any of your ideas. If you work on a matter and you see, you know, a process that can be improved, and you talk about it and say, hey, why don't we do it this way? Because it might be more efficient. Their response will always be like, yes, let's investigate that. I mean, just the other night, I was working with Todd on a matter. Todd's my mentor in tech. So I said, hey, Todd, like, why can't we do this this way? And he's like, that's, that's a really good idea. I've been thinking about that too. Let's collaborate. Let's think about this. Let's work this through. And that really echoes throughout all the practice areas. And it's a culture um, of change and innovation that we're really embracing here. And, and you also, just before you go, you had a bit of a different experience Anne, with the client solutions team before you started here. Do you want to just yeah. briefly talk about that? So I was very fortunate um, after my clerkship to um, get an offer to come back to work at Hong Wilcox with Sumit Pereira, our COO, and Peter Campbell is the director of our client solutions team. And I worked on a number of small law initiatives, so developing legal apps, um, kind of getting involved with process mapping and all these other different projects. And I thought that was really good because um, it helped me in my legal knowledge because that sets the foundation of the project. But then it also helps you think of different ways of working and also the, the, the ways in which you can improve yourself and help the firm really get that edge compared to the other firms out there. True. I'll just add to the... Um... You know, part of Evolve Always in Smarter Law is the tech side, um, and it's also about changing your mindset and the way you approach issues and the way you think about things. And I think that's the biggest way that the firms um, made me evolve as a lawyer is um, at uni, you kind of learn to, you're presented with an issue, you're asked a question, and you'll, you'll tackle the legal issues and come to the correct answer, hopefully. Um, but <laughs> but uh, the, the firm and some partners in particular have really, um, really do a good job of pushing you to think laterally about issues. Not only, you know, if the client comes to you with a specific problem and says, can I do this? Or, um, you know, is, is give me the legal way to um, get through this issue. Um, I think finding the technically correct legal answer is only part of it. I think um, to be a really good lawyer, you have to be able to um, take a step back and go, is, is what they're asking me actually the right question? Um, is, there, is there another question, another answer that is better for them commercially um, and meets their business needs um, better than what they're actually asking me? And I think, um, yeah, there's been certain partners who have really pushed me to develop that skill. And I think that's the biggest, the biggest thing I've noticed. Another question from the audience in front here. Okay. Yep. Um, just following on from what Anne said about sort of working together and collaboration being part of evolving, um, I'm just wondering if sort of directed at everyone, what experiences you've had working um, across practice groups and working with other areas to service clients and sort of promoting that collaboration? Uh, I'll start off. Um, I work uh, with different things around the firm every single day. Um, so, uh, just to step through some of the things we do, I mean, some of kind of, and I think I, I benefit from this the most because tax touches pretty much every aspect of everything. Um, and, and I mean, you know, in, in the employment team will have, uh, have, you know, they'll be entering into an agreement, they'll be negotiating something or they'll have an employment dispute. There will always be tax issues when one of our tax disputes gets to a, a certain point, we have to involve the litigation team. There'll be tax issues coming up on property things. Um, and I think um, it, it kind of applies to every team in varying levels, but there's always an opportunity to work across practice groups. And so you're not going to be pigeonholed to just, you know, someone will email you a tax question and you'll email them back the answer. Um, there's a big emphasis on collaborating across the teams and, um, making the best use of our resources um, and, and yeah it's, it's an everyday thing it's not it's not a, not something you have to think about it's just natural it's just we've got a property question let's go sit with the property team and uh, work it out over the day and, and I think you know, we, we might get to this later but we've got an agile working um, pilot going on at the moment that um, kind of makes it a bit easier to collaborate with the different teams 
and they have uh, spaces where you can um, uh, essentially hot desk um, in these large areas to kind of come together, sit together for a day, sit together for a week, whatever it takes uh, to you know, get through the problem in the best way possible. I think probably in the team that I'm in in statutory insurance Victoria, there is not so often the opportunity to collaborate with different sections around the firm, but we do work with other insurance teams nationally and there's a lot of insurance teams nationally. Um, in our team, there's been established a national collaboration working group and the whole, the whole purpose of the project is to um, collaborate more closely with the other insurance lawyers working from other cities and other places so that we can share our knowledge. Um, that's been fantastic because inevitably our lawyers in Queensland, though they're dealing with a different client, will be dealing with substantially the same issues as we are. And it's an amazing opportunity to build your networks, to meet new people and to just learn new ways of doing things. Um, even in inside statutory insurance, I've had a number of times when I've been called by, for example, our employment team, um, and there's been a question from someone, from a client in the employment team about a workers' compensation issue that they're wanting some advice on. Um, it happens pretty regularly. So there's a lot of opportunity to collaborate with other teams and other people all around the country. Another question. No, there's a few. Yep. Um, <laughs> just in regards to the Smarter Law Initiative, I guess, what do you think is the biggest change that you've seen Paula Wilcox implement throughout the last few years? That's a good question. Catherine's got the microphone. I'll take yep. that because I've been here the longest. Um, I remember when we were back at Burke Place and we we're all still in offices and dealing with paper files and um, old school mentality. Um, so from a practical perspective, even in our everyday lives, the biggest change has been just a, a embracing technology. Um, even the laptops we use today, they're all um, tablet laptops. Um, it's very mobile the way we work. Um, it's open to flexible work arrangements. People often work from home. You'll go and sit in the client's office. Quite often if we have a big litigation matter come in, we'll actually go out to the client and sit with the client and work through the process. Um, that comes into our smarter law practice as well in terms of really working with the client and understanding their process, what they need. So we're no longer providing a piece of legal advice saying here's our five page letter of advice. You really integrate with the client, you understand what they need. And as Todd said earlier, yes, they may be asking you question A to C, but really they're asking you question H and it's about understanding that. So I'd say that's the biggest change in terms of really integrating with our clients and giving them a commercial answer um, that helps them with their business and achieve their goals. Yep. I think I'll just add sure. um, on top of that. Um, in addition to being able to provide them with really good sound legal advice as well as good commercial advice, Whole Cox now offers um, really good creative technology-based solutions for some of our really large clients. So sometimes, you know, clients will approach us and say, we've got this internal process in place and it's not really working out well. How do you think we can go about doing it better? And to have large you know, clients come and approach us and ask us these questions and us being able to tell them like, perhaps you know, this platform would be suitable. Perhaps we can map out your process and identify the pain points and really you know, work alongside you and, and help you solve this problem. That's, I think, something that's very valuable now, um, especially seeing how um, you know, the legal industry is getting disrupted, but also how but um, our other clients are embracing technology with us. Thank you. I don't want to turn my back over here, so here we go. Uh, Aaron, you'll be next. <laughs> um, so just in relation to pro bono work, you've each got your own practice areas. Are you waiting for really a matter to get into your practice area where you can utilise it and give those hours of access to community or... Um, or are you able to sort of put your hand up and say, I want to get involved and be able to do that work? Good question. So it's definitely a case of you putting your hand up and um, getting involved in however much and whatever type of pro bono work interests you. Um, for example, I um, volunteer as a pro bono migration agent with Refugee Legal, working with refugees. And the way that it 
is set up is that we have a pro bono partner and a pro bono lawyer. They're dedicated in those roles. And there's a very active Yammer page on our internet, um, which is constantly advertising all of the opportunities for a pro bono that you can get involved in. So it's not necessarily section specific, though they might come up as well. There's a lot of scope to choose things that interest you and to get involved with them in whatever depth fits your capacity and fits your level of interest. So there's lots of opportunities like that. Uh, yeah, I think um, the, a lot of the pro bono community work we do can be kind of split into a couple of categories and that's um, work that is specific to your um, area of specialisation, um, which kind of lends itself to some areas more than others, such as you know, the employment team might get specific employment law queries that can be handled pro bono. And then the other side is um, not, uh, not linked to your area of speciality. I mean, my area of tax doesn't really lend itself to uh, much pro bono work because as a general rule, you've got to have a lot of money to get a big tax bill. Um, and so I, I, the opportunities for me are more um, along the lines of our asylum seeker project work uh, there will be uh, law reform submissions. Uh, we just completed one earlier this week, tomorrow sitting over there. Um, uh, there's, there's a whole range of things uh, and they really encourage everyone to get along. These conversations are had at team meetings about you know, what our pro bono hours um, on average per person and they encourage us to get up and get to uh, the, the firm and the industry aspirational targets. And I think early on there's um, there's a lot of opportunity to get as, as involved as you want in those projects. Just to add to what Todd said, there's also non-legal pro bono work, or it's, uh, I think it officially known as community involvement, I think, through um, programs such as ABCN, uh, where the non-legal staff members of our firm can actually get involved as well, which I think is really important. Um, so I think there's ABCN they're involved in going to reading programs with younger children from disadvantaged areas. So similar programs to that if you don't want to do legal pro bono work as well. Yeah, and that's available for everyone as well. Yeah. Um, you know, there'll be mentoring of year 11 students or um, from disadvantaged schools, various things like that. There's also charity events that we get involved in to raise money for. So there's lots of opportunities there. Aaron, I think you've got a question. Thanks for having me. Thanks to the panel. I am wondering, as professionals with a range of experience, do you have any maybe one or top two top tips for clerks starting out that you wish you had known at, 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 um, back then when you started? Good one. Steph. I'll touch on something that Anne mentioned earlier, and that is we don't expect you to know everything. We don't expect you to know the law. All we're looking for is people who have the right attitude and who really want to get involved. And that has a lot to do with um, communication, especially. Um, it means that you should really think about how long you're going to sit there borrowed into some, you know, very niche topic in a, in a research task before you just go back to the person who gave you those instructions and said, look, this is where I'm at. Am I on the right track or how much more do you want me to go into this? That kind of thing. Um, it's it's so much more about the personality that you bring and the type of person that you are and the experience that you want to have than what you know. Uh, I would add to that and say that the biggest one is you don't know what you don't know and therefore it's really important to listen. Like, you know, there might be some niche area of trust law. Of course, you've touched on the basic concepts at uni, but you, you don't know how a trust is written. If you're like me, you probably did contracts law and never saw a contract. <laughs> so... I think really immersing yourself, every opportunity that comes before you, um, even if it's just a niche research point on a larger task, ask about the background, ask about what goes on, because it's interesting and it helps you with your learning. Um, and the other thing that I'd recommend is, you know, every task has a purpose. We mentioned quiz before, like, well, I mentioned quiz before because I enjoy it. Um, it. It's not only getting up and reading the quiz, but it's an opportunity to build your public speaking skills. So you might be, you know, putting a brief together and yes, it might be a long task and you, uh, you may not end up doing it as a client, but it also teaches you attention to detail. So like, you know, you're not just doing a task, but every task that you do, you walk, you should be able to walk away from that and say, hey, out of that, I practice my attention to detail or, you know, my, it might be writing letters to a client, I got better at my um, verbal communication, my written communication, etc. cetera. Um, so look for the lesson in everything. 
uh, I think just relax and enjoy yourself. And um, it's you've only got three weeks. Um, we're not here to work you hard and, and make your lives misery for three weeks. It's um, it's mainly just to see, you know, uh, are, are you willing to have a go at something? Um, are you willing to raise your hand when you don't know something, but also have a crack? And would we like to sit next to you? You know, have you, are we willing to have you sit in the next to us? Oh, seriously, like we, we encourage, encourage everyone to you know, bring your whole self to work. So how did you make the cut? <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Because you run the grad program. Yeah, and right. <laughs> okay. Any, yep. And it's been touched on slightly already, but I'd love to hear how, I guess, the hallmark of smart law kind of impacts on your day-to-day Work all the materialize in your um, yeah, day to day matters. Um, I think for me, the smarter law is an open license to better the way you do things. It's an open invitation or a challenge that the firm's laying down to be a better lawyer and help the firm to be a better firm. Um, and I think that plays out into everything. Um, when it comes to rolling it out, like even collaboration, it could be, I guess, a point of bettering. Like today, I was talking with Todd about rolling out some general trust um, refreshes to the banking finance team. So I think once you look through that lens of smarter law, you see every challenge or everything that isn't as efficient as it could be. Well, the firm's giving you an open license to go and um, address the way that's done. And if you talk to a partner about it or a senior lawyer or even someone in our um, corporate services team, so this might be our people and culture team or our accounts team, they're happy to talk about it. They're, they're keen and interested and I think yeah, it's just, it is something that colours everything that we do here, and I think it's really important. Good answer. Microphone's coming around. Okay. So, um, I had a question in relation to uh, the social side of things. Um, does the team dynamic kind of change, or do you have events as, like, the whole firm has it? And, yeah, something like that. I'll take that one because in my view, this is such a good firm to be at socially. Um, there's lots of whole firm events that we've got the um, end of financial year party, we've got the end of year party, but more than that, there's just so many options and opportunities for people to all get together from a team perspective or a bigger perspective. There's our, this has been said so many times, but we get together in all of our teams every night at five o'clock or quarter past five to just do the daily quiz from the age and have a laugh and just catch up on what our days were and hopefully win some chocolate, um, depending on what team you get to be in. Um, there's, we have a lot of really strong friendships that form here and I think that's because the culture allows that to occur. We also aren't in offices. We have open plan desk arrangements downstairs and that really lends itself to the social aspect as well because you end up getting to know the people around you really well and I don't know if you would be able to do that so much if everyone was closed up in an office. Um, if you walk into any of our kitchen areas between 12 and 2 o'clock, there'll be people all over the joint sitting around having their meals together and chatting. And I honestly couldn't say highly enough how many opportunities there are for social engagement with as many people as you want to. We also have a couple of committees around the firm who are their sole role is to get people involved and can make connections. So we've got the social committee um, and the sporting committee here in Melbourne. There's also the arts committee, um, environmental committee. I'm sure I'm missing a lot. But in terms of social aspects, certainly there's the social committee and the sports committee are primarily responsible for those. Um, I'm in, heavily involved in the sporting committee. Um, we're currently organising teams for Melbourne Corporate Games, which is where thousands of participants play netball, soccer, basketball, swimming, whatever you want to do. Um, so that's coming up in November. We also participate in fun runs. Um, we have a golf competition. There's all sorts of things going on. So you also, yes, there's the natural social vibe, but you also have the option to jump in and get involved in some of the more um, intense social ones as well. I think that that's like um, really amazing in terms of all the activities that we have here. Recently, we had a bring your friend to love drinks. Mm -hmm. And that was just super fun. You know, we had fairy lights and cheese platters and it was just, it was nice. And then last year we had a um, 
get together for our dogs and that was just amazing <laughs> like and it was raining but you know Tony may be in Syrup up with this dog and um, that was really fun but also to touch on Yama so Yama is a huge um, thing at Hong Wook Cops we use it like we use Facebook and Instagram um, you know you, you, there's like different groups on Yama so you've got your team groups and you've also got like your animals at Hong Wook Cops and of course like the doggy pictures which <laughs> then you get a lot of likes for and comments and that's nice so then like everyone kind of knows that you have a dog um, and then you know you get to like share your thoughts and your ideas and um, sometimes you share you know good news like winning cases and so everyone's just into like everyone's connected everyone knows what's going on and you just feel like a really huge family there questions all right good to you thank you very much um i just had a question i know there's a little bit of time yet until the clerkship program starts and even longer yet until the graduate program what sort of skills would you recommend us trying to develop from now until then and harnessing and focusing on? Good question. I should write these down. These are really good questions. <laughs> I, I don't, it's not something you can study for. It's not something you can open a book and say, okay, I need to learn this in order to do a great seasonal clerkship or a great graduate year. Um, at Hall & Wilcox, we really value you bringing your true self to work. We don't want you to turn up with a learned personality or wrote answers to a question. So I, I, honest, I honestly don't believe it's something you can truly prepare for. Having said that, some of the big things to keep in mind and perhaps that you can learn and practice through your uni studies and through your part-time jobs, big thing for me is time management. My number one pet peeve is when people commit to a deadline and don't tell me when they're not going to meet it. So back to what Steph was saying, just that communication. So perhaps if you're bad at that in time management, start keeping a list. Say, okay, I've got to do X, Y, and Z by this time. And that's just little things that you can start introducing into your life. It'll just help you with your general career. I think coming from a very practical perspective, and that's, I think it might be just me, but sleep patterns. When I was a uni student, like, you know, I would sleep at like midnight, 1, 1 a.m. But when you start working, especially when you, you know, do your three weeks in the class, you like get into a good sleeping pattern, sleep at 10, you know, wake up early, come for breakfast at home so you have your free breakfast every morning, you get to meet people, talk to people. So I think that's a good thing to keep in mind. Has everyone found the clerkship application process a bit stressful? <laughs> yeah. Have you all got exams coming up too? So you're probably focusing on that. You're coming up to the mid-semester break, which is really swapped back in semester two. Yeah. <laughs> When you hit the ground running with your clerkships, I would really recommend taking a weekend or whatever you, after your exams are done or even after the seasonal clerkship application sort of closed and that process is done, just reflect, package it up, remember what you learned, maybe jot a few things down. I had like a little notebook of my experiences, which interviews I thought went well, what I learned from those particular interviews. And then that way, you know, it's not bearing on your mind all the time. You're not coming back thinking, oh, what if I said this? What if I did that? It's all about sort of then moving forward and taking that next step. And then when you hit your clerkship and you graduate, you walk in refresh and you walk in happy and I think that's really important because ultimately we want to work with happy and enjoyable people to be around and I think you know making sure you, making sure you give yourself that chance to refresh is really important especially at such a stressful time towards the back end of your degrees so uh, we had one over there yep. <laughs> this is being recorded as well for people from interstate and other people that can't make it tonight so yeah, look, something that really attracted me to Holland Wilcox was probably your Frank program, given the benefits of probably working with some startups. I was hoping if you guys have had some experience in the program, if you could elaborate on that a bit further and sort of what opportunities are there if you're working at Holland Wilcox to put your hand up and say, look, I want to get involved with Frank. I was officially the Frank champion for CDR when it first started. Um, having said that, sort of came to a realisation that perhaps Frank wasn't something that CDR um, could assist with at this point in time. So it is much, I think, much more a front-end transactional program. Um, having said that, I was involved in it and I was in CDR. So if you want to be involved in something like that, all you have to do is ask and all you have to do is put your hand up. Because as everyone said tonight, as long as you show that you're eager and interested, um, everyone will make the opportunity available to you. Um, Frank runs a couple of faster classes as well throughout the year and 
they're usually open to um, people joining and you know talking and building relationships with the startups so um, that's I think I found that really interesting and also Frank has a group on Yama and they usually posting up you know stuff like hey we've got this coming up we need help with this and you know you comment like I can assist and you get contacted by friends so I would say that you definitely can get involved quite easily. Um, just to add on what Anne and Catherine said too it's not um we also work with Stone and Chalk, who are another incubator startup. So it's not just the Frank program. Um, we, the grads, which graduates, are, we've just found out we're going up to Sydney in October um, to work with the Stone and Chalk program up there, um, sort of learn something about how a lot of these entrepreneurs go through their thought processes and sort of get involved really at a you know a deeper level in how they go about conducting their business. So um, there are these formal relationships with multiple stakeholders, and I think that's really important. Um, we also have a few experts in the firm who specialise in blockchain, especially there's a few in um, banking, uh, one in banking finance, a couple in tax, and they have, you can talk to these guys for hours about blockchain, and it really boggles my mind. So even just yeah, having general conversations with people, the more interest you show, the more likely it is that they'll pull you into whatever they're working on, and that's certainly my experience. Any more questions? We've got time for one or two more questions at the back here. Thanks all for giving up your evening to speak with us tonight. Um, could a couple of you describe maybe a typical day um, for a clerk or a grad at the firm? Our current grads. <laughs> I roll in at about eight o'clock. <laughs> <laughs> I usually have uh, cornflakes with honey on top. Um, and I don't know, I actually find the mornings, especially that time when you're at the coffee machine, a really social time, you just see people from other teams that you wouldn't see in your day to day operations and I think it's also a really good way to network I don't think you realize that formally but you know that person you see a lot of people have the same coffee breaks at the same time during the day so you keep bumping into the same people and I think you'd be surprised how quickly you build that rapport with those people um, I actually start work about 8 30 um, things as a clerk and as a grad will tend to come in from left of field you'll be working on something and something will come in and that's a really good um, opportunity to work on your um, skills in terms of time management and dealing with expectations um, I work one-on-one -on -one with partners and senior lawyers all the time. You're exposed to um, people at the high level all the time. I'd worked at other firms where it was, you know, work was very much delegated down. And you didn't necessarily have that connection with the top. That's certainly not the case here. I get most of my work from partners. Um, and it's direct feedback loop too. Um, I did a piece of work today for a partner in our banking finance team. Um, and he sat down and gave me the feedback directly. It's not all filtered down. So I think, you know, there's no typical day um, other than the breakfast and the coffee in the morning. Um, <laughs> But I think as a general nature of how you go about things, it's um, very social, a lot of feedback. Um, yeah, and a lot of direct connection with the other practitioners around you. Yeah, I think that's quite similar. So sometimes the grads will have breakfast together and that's really nice because we don't usually see each other very often. Um, so yeah, roll in, um, have brekkie, have coffee, and then maybe another coffee break at 10.30. <laughs> Um, but then also I wanted to add because Hong Wilcox offers really good gym classes, which is another way for you to um, network. So my day would be, um, yeah, breakfast, you do your work, um, and then I'll, I'll go down to the gym and you have your boxing classes with Tuesdays are boxing classes, Tony McBean's there as well, good opportunity to find a managing partner. Um, <laughs> that's all good and fun. And like Charlie said as well, like we do work um, very closely with partners and you develop a really good close relationship with them as well and and they really take on like not just the partners but pretty much i feel like everyone i've worked with take on a, a good mentoring role and they really invest time in you and, and teach you about you know certain legal concepts and i find that that's really useful and i enjoy that as a grad so right I might just add that if you're in um, statutory insurance as a grad the day um, will usually start off in the morning by getting ready to go up to the magistrate's court or potentially the county court to appear for the direction series. So that's something that's um, really cool, I think, to get to do so early in your career to do appearance work um, quite frequently. So that will usually take you out until about 11 o'clock or 11.30 if it's a busy day down in the court precinct. Um, and you'll work on a mixture of work that you've been um, allocated or potentially as a grad you're also sometimes given some of your own files to work through which can be a really great responsibility um, and then you get to 
the end of the day and you're responsible for delivering the quiz. So you'll deliver that to the team um, and then you're at the end. So that's what a typical day would look like as a grad in SIB. Just quickly, and I think this is something maybe that we've overlooked, but as a client too, client exposure, um, you regularly get called into phone calls to teleconferences with clients. You get invited along to meetings. We actually get to go and shake their hand. Um, that's something that I perhaps didn't expect as someone coming in so junior, um, but I'm all the time getting invited to these type of things. So there is that exposure, that opportunity to you know, see who you're ultimately working for. And I think that's really important um, to be involved with. Um, and it's a great opportunity as a junior to see that roll out. Just so to add to Charlie's, like as a seasonal club, we had the opportunity to collaborate with different practice areas as well. And I remember that as a seasonal club, um, I was working on a matter where we were like, okay, we have to work with CDR. And so we had a meeting with Captain Sharp. And that was, I just, I was really glad to have the opportunity because I see that, you know, Hong Kong truly is a place where, you know, practices do collaborate with each other and provide a foolproof legal advice to clients. Any more questions? Probably time for one more. Yep. Um, just on that point, um, as clerks, when you hit the ground, you're there for three weeks. Are you encouraged to reach out to people in other practice groups and catch up with them and see what goes on in their practice groups as well? Uh, yeah. So, what happens when you come in uh, is you'll be given a supervising partner. Uh, a mentor and a buddy in your own team, but then based on your preferences um, uh, for the clerkship of what team you want to be put in, um, your next best preference, uh, you'll be given a contact person in that other team in case you want to chat to them um, uh, about what you know work would be like in their team. And so you're encouraged to reach out to them, have a coffee with them, just go around and chat to them, um, well, them, them in particular, but any team you want uh, to get a better experience better exposure to what life would be like in the other teams, not just the team you're doing the clerkship in. Anything else? Okay. Well, I won't hold anyone else back from drinks and nibblies as well. So I think we'll wrap it up there. I want to um, really thank you all for some great questions. They were really, um, truly exceptional questions tonight. And I want to thank our fantastic panel. So a round of applause. Thank you very much. Um, and thank you all for taking the time. So if you, as I said before, if you can um, stay, you're more than welcome to stay, have some drinks and nibblies, and there's some um, other people from our interview um, panel that you might recognise um, out there that are eager to speak to you and answer any more questions you may have. And obviously feel free to speak to anyone on the panel here tonight um, to gain some more information. So as I said, tonight's really all about you. Um, before we go, I just want to say that this is a very competitive process. I think you all know that now, but I want to congratulate you all on um, being um, interviewed here. Um, you're one of 60 people um, from about 500 applications that we received. So you did a really great job um, in getting that um, interview as well. So. As you all know, we can't make office to everyone. Um, we're looking at about 20 positions, um, 10 in summer and 10 in winter. Um, so whatever happens on the 10th of October at 10 a.m., um, I really hope that, um, obviously, we'd love to make you all offers, but the reality is we can't. But I hope you get either offers from us or someone else. And if you don't, I just want to say it's not the end of the world, trust me, because this is the first step in the process of becoming a lawyer. It's not the only step. I don't think that's really reiterated enough at university. There's many here tonight, um, including myself, that have been um, through other means and not through the clerkship process. So I just want to say that um, if you really want to be a lawyer, whether it's at Hall and Wilcox or another great firm out there, um, persist. And there are other avenues, whether it's via paralegal, off-market opportunities, um, just by sort of keeping your eyes on the fire and, and having a go and, and seeing what doors open for you. Um, so on that note, I want to wish you all the best of luck for the future and I'll hope to see you um, tonight and um, have a great night. Thank you.